joined in. Yes. yes. Okay. Lokesh, wait, tell us when you're ready. Yes, sir. We are live. Just one sec. Yes, sir. I think now we are live on YouTube. Okay. Yeah, six o'clock. We are ready. Yeah, okay. Okay. <coughs> Good evening and uh, welcome to this uh, IAO HNS webinar series two on the practice of anesthesia in ENT practice. So the, the topic of today's webinar is anesthesia in ENT practice. It's a very, very important topic and uh, a lot of people are very interested in listening to these experts. But uh, before anything, I would request the president of the Indian Academy of Otorhinolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery, Dr. K.K. Handa, who's the chief ENT consultant at Medanta Medicity to uh, you know, give a few words of introduction and set the ball rolling. So over to Dr. K.K. Handa. Thank you, Dr. Mohan. I welcome all of you in the panel and people listening on behalf of Indian Academy of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery. As you know, uh, as a scientific body, we conduct various symposia, seminars, and there have been a lot since the, in these COVID times. And uh, today it's not just for ENT fraternity. Uh, we have uh, eminent collection of anesthetists, some of uh, whom are associated with us uh, in our centers and some are from institutions. And the aim is to get a perspective uh, about anesthesia, which is a very, very important part. Now COVID is almost in India uh, is in the third or fourth month right now. And it has uh, upset uh, our professional work, our professional lives, changed how we work in a big way. And it is dynamic. The situations are changing almost every week. What we talked of two months back may not hold good today. So it becomes very important. Uh, few issues regarding our joint area in operation theaters, when to start working, what are the protocols, uh, wherever we need to do pre-operative COVID testing, during surgery, extubation, all those issues are very, very important. As, a, as Indian Academy, we had met before about a month back and got out several guidelines, which were of immense help. We got very good feedback on conduct of our ENT practice, including uh, OTs, anesthesia, et cetera. But that was one month back. Now a lot has happened in that one month. That time our dictum was we will only do emergency and semi-emergency surgeries. But today, as we get back to our work, because care is important, COVID patients are important, but our specialty, we have a lot of uh, emergent patients, semi-emergent patients, patients waiting for surgery. And secondly, it is a livelihood for a lot of us. So we cannot indefinitely uh, sit back. So the aim of this panel is let us get inputs from our anesthesia colleagues. Uh, let us discuss it out among ourselves and uh, reach a consensus where we have to go. And there is none other than Dr. Mohan Kameshwaran uh, to moderate the panel, which is a mix of uh, eminent ENT surgeons and anesthetists from all over the country who represent institutions, who represent corporate setups, who represent uh, specialty ENT hospitals and solo practices to get a holistic view of the whole thing. So I give it over to Dr. Mohan for conducting the panel. Please. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Handa, for the uh, wonderful introduction. Uh, the, uh, this, today, you know, uh, to put things in perspective, you know, anesthesia, I think, is one of the most challenging fields of medicine, even in the best of times. And having said that, anesthesia in ENT uh, specialty is probably the most challenging aspect of anesthesia because we are all fighting for the same space. And on top of that, you know, we put tremendous uh, demands on our anesthetic colleagues, uh, sometimes giving them very difficult uh, airways to uh, to uh, you know to use. So it's uh, as it is, an ENT anesthesia is considered as one of the most frustrating aspects of anesthesia. But now add a third factor, and that is uh, you know the the challenge of the uh, the COVID pandemic. 
so now we have this uh, additional uh, burden on their shoulders so i think it's a, it's a very difficult time for anesthesia in general and particularly neat anesthesia so i think it's very important that we you know give due uh, credence to all the anesthetic colleagues uh, and also learn from them in the process about how they are going to be facing these challenges the human mind is uh, is an amazing thing you know when when we are ever whenever we face an impossible situation we always find some solutions to surmount those difficulties and now is no exception so i think uh, you know uh, i would first like to introduce our anesthetic colleagues who have very graciously taken time out to on a sunday evening to share their knowledge with us so first of all uh, dr anand sharma from uh, medanta medicity is senior consultant anesthetist and uh, we really happy to have you with us uh, dr anand uh, then uh, dr babita guy who is professor of anesthesiology in, in pgi uh, chandigarh Uh, and she is going to be also uh, going to be uh, one of the panelists and sharing uh, from an institutional perspective. Uh, Dr. Dinesh Goswami, who is uh, a, a consultant anesthetist at Nightingale Hospital, a very well-known hospital in Guwahati, and uh, you know he is very much into EAT anesthesia, uh, having worked along with Dr. Gautam Khan. So we are very eager to uh, you know get some uh, ideas from him. Uh, Dr. Ganga uh, is a senior consultant anesthetist at Messiar in uh, Kori Kod, and uh, he again is uh, an anesthetist who spends a, a lot of time uh, or all his time probably with the uh, ENT practice. So it's very nice to have his perspective. Uh, then uh, we have Dr. Jagannath, who is the chief anesthetist at uh, Madras Lead Research Foundation. Uh, he is probably the senior most uh, person here in this crowd. You know, it's almost. 50 years of anesthesia practice very interesting to get his perspective because i think he has uh, been working in different parts of the world and has also seen many many uh, big catastrophes i think he was in algiers when there was this a huge uh, earthquake there and they had a huge uh, uh, relief effort so he has had a lot of experience in uh, managing uh, disasters uh, i think uh, but this is a unique perspective this new disaster so it's nice to have him here and uh, probably the youngest of the lot is uh, dr manoj uh, who is also here with us so he is a consultant anesthetist at madras research foundation and it's nice to have from a young uh, anesthetist perspective uh, does he want to continue in eat anesthesia or does he want to throw it and go back into something more uh, reasonable so to have him uh, dr pradeep uh, uh, pradeep kumar is uh, again a senior consultant anesthetist at messiar uh, in kori kod so is uh, again a uh, uh, you know a very welcome uh, addition to the panelists and uh, we will have a perspective from him as well uh, dr sharda who is uh, a senior consultant anesthetist at madras research foundation in chennai again uh, uh, a person with tremendous experience in the field Uh, and who is uh, now uh, almost completely uh, you know focused on ENT anesthesia so it's very good to have you with us and uh, welcome to you. and dr satyabama uh, who is uh, the uh, you know the, the night in armor today and uh, she'll be making the main presentation today she is a consultant anesthetist at madras research foundation a very dynamic uh, young lady who uh, will be sharing uh, a presentation and about how uh, they are managing uh, things uh, of their end at Madras Research Foundation. So it's nice to have them. And of course, uh, our uh, panel of uh, ENT surgeons, who many of, uh, in fact, all of them, uh, they need a very little introduction. Uh, Dr. Gautam Kaun is, uh, you know, he's a young Turk in uh, Northeast. Uh, he's uh, mm -hmm. a very dynamic name. Whenever you think about Northeast, you think about Gautam. Uh, ANT wise, he's he's a, a shooting star. So it's really nice to have Gautam with us today. Uh, of course, Dr. Handa uh, needs no introduction. You know, he he's a man of who wears many hats. Uh, now, of course, he's the president of Indian Academy, but a very versatile surgeon uh, who has made his uh, mark in many aspects of uh, orthodontics. Uh, Dr. Manoj Manikot, who is of course a star uh, in the south, uh, is a uh, surgeon at Excellence and the director of Messia in Kori Kod. Uh, is a surgeon who is very very popular as a speaker. 
I think uh, he must have lost count of the number of webinars he's been in this particular season. But it's nice to have Dr. Manoj with us because he'll always bring a very unique perspective. And of course, uh, Professor Naresh Panda, who needs very little introduction, you know, he's a director and professor of otolaryngology at the foremost postgraduate institution of the country, PGI, Chandigarh. Uh, a man who's very, very academically renowned, not just here, but uh, world over. And currently, he is also the member of the, uh, the IFOS, the highest uh, uh, body in otolaryngology in the world. He's the uh, governing body member. And uh, it's really a, a great pleasure to have you with us, Dr. Uh, Naresh. It's, it's a, a privilege to have you. And finally, of course, Dr. Vijay Krishnan, the, our dynamic secretary, without whom none of this will happen. You know, he's a, the brain behind the whole thing and also the brawn behind the whole thing. He's a man with the brain and the muscle. We put this together. So, and uh, uh, technology research. So it's a wonderful combination to have him. So thank you, Vijay. Uh, for organizing this whole thing. A very special thanks, of course, to Jansen, uh, who yes, made this whole thing possible. So with that, I would now uh, request uh, Dr. Satya Bama to start her keynote presentation. And after the presentation, then we will have time for discussion, for asking a few questions to the panelists. And then I would uh, also be requesting the, uh, the audience to post questions uh, which will appear in the chat box for me. And I will be then asking the panel the questions from the audience as well. I request that whenever you post a question, please put your name as well, so that we know from whom the question is coming. It will be very helpful for the, uh, the uh, panel. So thank you very much. Over to Dr. Satya Bama. Hello and good evening to one and all from the Anastasia team at Madras ENT Research Foundation, Chennai. Tonight, I will be speaking on ENT anesthesia and COVID times. There have been several webinars on COVID anesthesia and today we from Merv present anesthesia for ENT surgery. Why is there such a hue and cry about COVID-19? These are the reasons. Highly contagious with rapid spread, no specific treatment protocol available, vaccine is still under trial, mortality is high in elderly above 60 years and people with comorbidities, Inconvenience of home or institutional isolation when tested positive and tracking and quarantine of contacts is laborious. The main concern in every walk of life is to control transmission of the disease. Another point of concern is hospital setting. In hospital setting is a high incidence of false negatives and RT-PCR test. So we presume every COVID negative patient to be COVID positive when taking up for surgery. Once community spread is insignificant, all cases may be presumed to be positive. The modes of transmission are droplets, aerosols, and fomites. Droplets are larger than 10 microns, so they fall on the ground. Aerosols are smaller than 5 microns, so they remain suspended in air up to 3 hours. These are some of the aerosol generating procedures in anesthesia, mask ventilation, intubation, extubation, awake fiber optic intubation. Oral cavity and tracheal suctioning, high flow nasal oxygen, non invasive ventilation, nebulization, and cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Risk of exposure during anesthesia for all OT personnel is very high because of airway management and associated aerosol generation, long duration of time spent in OT. This risk can be mitigated by use of proper PPE, good hand hygiene, minimizing and containment of aerosols, which is the main topic of discussion today. Unprecedented times call for unprecedented measures. In today's webinar, we present how we have adapted anesthesia practices in COVID times at MRF. Management of anesthesia is discussed under the following subjects. Preoperative assessment precautions in OPD, theta precautions and setup, conduct of general anesthesia, difficult intubation scenario, COVID positive patient coming for surgery, general anesthesia versus local anesthesia. Pre-anesthetic checkup is discussed under the following topics. Donning, masked patient, distancing during assessment, clinical examination, COVID testing and scheduling of the surgery, disinfection of the room and equipment, doffing. Each of these topics will be discussed in detail in the next few slides. 
the anesthetist and the assistant should have donned the ppes properly having removed watch jewelry pen id card etc before the patient enters the pre assessment clinic the ppe contains a cap shoe cover gloves gown mask either a three ply or n95 face shield or goggles the same precautions are taken when assessing admitted in patients for surgery during donning it is useful to have somebody read out this sequence as you all have been following already before the covid times this is how we examine the patient in the pre anesthetic clinic without any worries about distancing now the patient wearing a face mask sits across the table at a distance of about 3 feet from the anesthetist no attendant is allowed inside the room unless the patient is a child patient with tracheostomy has to wear a mask over the tracheostomy tube also while assessing airway the patient is asked to remove the mask we assess the mouth opening denture malampatty score and stature without touching or going near the patient maximum exposure time to a patient without a mask should not exceed 5 minutes auscultation of chest is essential digital stethoscope scores over the regular one but in our center we use this method of standing behind the patient to auscultate which is quite safe oxygen saturation is sensitive and early indicator of covid pneumonitis and often precedes clinical symptoms in otherwise asymptomatic patient with unexplained hypoxia ct chest is mandatory exception is a child where rt pcr is done instead of ct chest and surgery is deferred for 2 weeks if possible if even if rt pcr is negative all patients must have recent covid test report before surgery time between covid test report and surgery should be between 24 and 48 hours if delayed beyond 48 hours patient may acquire a coronavirus infection in the interim period after covid testing patient is strictly instructed to isolate himself at home till the surgery if a patient comes for assessment without covid test report a tentative date of surgery is given surgery is confirmed once the test is negative if a patient comes for assessment with a covid negative report admit the patient in a non covid ward and perform surgery at the earliest all precautions are taken with covid negative patients they being considered positive because of the high incidence of false negative results inconclusive report means covid report is negative but there is high suspicion based on symptoms repeat the test after 5 days and proceed accordingly covid positive patients will be taken up depending on the condition of the patient and the nature of the surgery nature of the surgery determines the course of further action in these patients as per iohns guidelines nature of the surgery is categorized into emergent non emergent time sensitive and priority elective emergent surgery are those which are performed without postponement example tracheostomy for strider non emergent surgery are those which have prognostic impact if it is delayed more than 3 days example acute onset facial palsy on a chronic otitis media patient time sensitive surgery has a prognostic impact if it is delayed beyond 30 days like head and neck malignancy priority elective surgery has a prognostic impact if it is delayed by 2 to 3 months example for a pediatric cochlear implant after assessment clinic is over the patient has to be disinfected the room has to be disinfected for use the next time floor is mopped with 1% sodium hypochlorite table chair door knobs all stationary items kept on the table which includes bp apparatus pulse oximeter pen stethoscope etc are cleaned with 25% benzoyl spray the anesthetist and the assistant should change gloves after seeing every patient avoid taking your cell phone wallet handbags and wearing accessories to the clinic doffing to be done properly in the opd itself doffing is done in this sequence it is done properly in the opd itself it has been shown that the risk of transmission is higher during the doffing of ppe so this step has to be performed meticulously with a colleague guiding you through the process the pre anesthesia anesthesia checkup for emergency surgery patient is done with full precautions because of the absence of covid report covid test should be done along with basic investigations in emergency cases now that the patient has been assessed and surgery scheduled we move on to theater setup and precautions taken there which will be discussed under the following topics uh preparation to enter the ot team members and their role 
barrier protection, conduct of general anesthesia, difficult intubation scenario, extubation, and disinfection. Anesthesia team should enter OT only after donning PPE. Only the anesthesia team should be present in the OT till the patient is anesthetized. Patient should wear a three-ply surgical mask during transfer from ward to OT. Anesthesia records are written outside the theater after the surgery is over. The anesthesia team comprises only of three members as shown in the picture. The first anesthetist pre oxygenates holds mask for bag mask ventilation, intubates and inflates the endotracheal tube cuff. The second anesthetist administers drugs, bag ventilates, connects circuit after intubation, checks air entry and also assists in difficult intubation. The anesthesia technician gives instruments and gadgets required for anesthesia. As mentioned earlier, the barrier prevents aerosol spread during induction and intubation by creating a partition between the patient and the theater environment. Ideal barrier should be transparent, should contain the aerosol effectively, should have minimum access points to avoid aerosol spread, should be easily available, should be cost effective and be easily disposable, should not be cumbersome for the anesthetist. The choice of barriers is very small at present. We will have a brief review of them in the next few slides. The first of these is the intubation box. It is an acrylic polycognate box with three portals or two portals. Two on the proximal end of the anesthetist to insert hands and one on the right side for giving instruments in the case of three portal intubation box. Advantages are they are reusable, can be washed with soap and water, hence inexpensive. Transparent, can insert your hands up to the elbow. Disadvantages are the foot end is open and has to be covered with a sheet to prevent spread of aerosol. It is difficult to maintain the sniffing position for intubation, necessitating the use of video laryngoscope, which all centers may not have. Restriction of hand movements inside the box is there and difficulty in use of intubation aids also like bougie and stillet. It may not sit properly on the operating table and it uh, is mostly available in one size only. So it doesn't suit individuals of various stages. The second one is a microscope cover with three openings. The large one is for the objective. The two small ones are for IPs. We started using this from the very first day when COVID-19 was declared as pandemic. The bigger opening is used to insert the anesthetist's left hand. Of the two small openings on the right side, one is for the anesthetist's right hand and the other for the technician to give endotracheal tubes, bougie, etc. for intubation. Advantages are they are readily available in OT, inexpensive, transparent, and disposable. Covers patient up to the chest, allows hand mobility, can use any technique of intubation. Disadvantages are the holes are on the different, la different layers of the plastic cover, creating many folds, affecting visibility and maneuvering of the endotracheal tube. Hence, we modified the microscope cover to have two large openings on the top layer for the anesthetist's hands and one large opening on the side for the technician to give intubation aids, as you see in the picture. Coming to the conduct of anesthesia, this guideline was formulated by Royal College of Anesthesiologists for managing airway in patients with COVID-19. I'll just go through it fastly. Ensure institutional team and individual preparedness. Have a strategy and brief the team. Wear appropriate checked PPE. Focus on promptness and reliability. Use a tracheal intubation checklist. Ensure all necessary airway kit is present in the room before tracheal intubation. Create a COVID-19 tracheal intubation trolley or pack. Involve the smallest number of staff necessary. Avoid aerosol generating procedures wherever possible. The most appropriate airway manager should manage the airway. Use a cognitive aid if difficulty arises and use clear language and closed loop communication. Pre-medication anti-silogog is given to reduce aerosol generation. Vomiting can generate aerosol too. So an anti-emetic pre-medication can be given we use propofol for induction and maintenance. This obviates the need for anti-emetic premedication. Pre-oxygenase is done with 100% oxygen for 5 to 8 minutes with 3-ply 
mask on as you're seeing in the first picture. If oxygen saturation does not pick up, remove the three ply mask, reassure the patient, place the intubation cover over the face and pre-oxygenate, thereby minimizing aerosol spread. Use adequate doses of drugs to achieve deep plane of anesthesia, thereby minimizing coughing, vomiting, regurgitation, salivary and bronchial secretions. Use three HME bacterial viral filters, one attached to the patient end of the circuit and the others to the inspiratory and expiratory ports of the machine. Use short acting muscle relaxants to reduce the duration of mask ventilation and wait for adequate muscle relaxation to prevent bucking during intubation. Uh, reduce the time taken for intubation by keeping the necessary equipment ready. This can be done during the period of mask ventilation. The things that are kept ready are a laryngoscope with the correct size blade, endotracheal tube of correct size, cuff checked and lubricant applied and oral suction. After intubation, cuff of the tube is first inflated and then the tube is connected to the closed circuit. Clamping of the tip of the endotracheal tube is done in many centers, but this can damage it. So we prefer isolation of the field from the OT environment is the better option. Air entry is checked by auscultation. The stethoscope is placed on the intubation cover to prevent contamination. Correct endotracheal tube placement is confirmed by capnography. Take adequate time to fix the endotracheal tube firmly and recheck the air entry. This step is very important because once the intubation cover is removed, should there be any endotracheal tube displacement, the whole process of safe intubation has to be repeated. After intubation, the cover is removed by rolling inwards so as not to expose the contaminated surfaces. Outer gloves are removed inside the cover, taking care not to contaminate the inner gloves and disposed in the right bin. Hand hygiene should be performed specifically after removing the gloves after contact with soiled or contaminated areas before touching anesthesia machine or its contents and after every contact with the patient. The anesthesia workstation is moved as far to the foot end of the patient as possible so that the anesthetic anesthetist is distanced from the surgical field. Ensure easy IV access by using extensions. Use of patient warmer to be avoided whenever possible. The anesthetist wears the PPE throughout the procedure. These are a few techniques to prevent or minimize aerosols. Small tidal volume is provided with gentle bag mask ventilation. Low flow anesthesia technique is used during maintenance of anesthesia with closed circuit system. To avoid OT contamination from the expiratory gases, scavenging is essential. This picture here shows a scavenging system we use at present. The expired gas coming out of the AGS port is connected to the suction jar using a corrugated tube. The suction jar which contains 1% sodium hypochlorite is, connect, is connected to the central suction. During extubation, only the anesthesia team should be present in the OT. Thorough oral cavity and endobronchial suctioning should be done before reversal of muscle relaxation. ET tube plasters can be removed before deflating the cuff for faster extubation. Endotracheal tube cuff to be deflated just before extubation. Put on the patient's three-ply mask as soon as the ET tube is removed and oxygenate the patient for a few minutes and ensure adequate recovery before shifting directly to the ward without recovery room observation. We tried two techniques to extubate, one of which is shown here. The head is enveloped with fresh intubation cover, oral and tracheal suctioning done, cuff deflated and tube removed. Then three ply mask is applied over the patient's face and patient oxygenated. Cover removed using same precautions as after intubation and patient shifted out of theater. This is the second method. In this method, we, a narrow long plastic cover is put over the disconnected endotracheal tube, cuff deflated and the cover is advanced over the endotracheal tube as it is being removed. Three ply face mask is applied for the patient and oxygenated. Since it covers only the endotracheal tube and not the whole face, we prefer using a fresh intubation cover for extubation as explained earlier. A word about general anesthesia and very short procedures. If patient is uncooperative for the procedure to be done under local anesthesia, as a child coming for suture removal, IV induction with propofol and oxygenation by face mask is done if the child has IV access. If there is no IV access, induction is sevoflurane by mask inside the intubation cover. 
uh, this here is a two year old girl who had a cochlear implant done and came for post oral suture removal she came to the theater wearing a face mask and topical prilocaine applied over dorsum of both hands venflon was inserted and induced with propofol with child breathing spontaneously intubation cover was used to oxygenate by mask a slip was made in the cover for surgical access after complete recovery patient was shifted to the ward coming to difficult intubation in the last couple of months we encountered a few cases of difficult intubation we used buji or video laryngoscope as was required we also did fob intubation after induction in one case which we would like to share with you this patient here was an anticipated difficult airway case whose cormac lehen was grade 4 with regular macintosh blade and external laryngeal manipulation we used a buji to assist intubation buji was successfully inserted into the trachea endotracheal tube railroaded and airway was secured the buji was then withdrawn this is another anticipated difficult airway where we decided to use video laryngoscope to intubate the patient as often happens with the video laryngoscope the view of the larynx was cormac lehen grade 1 as seen in the picture but there was difficulty in maneuvering the endotracheal tube into the glottis a buji was used to intubate here the buji is seen in the glottis with a railroad and endotracheal tube we anticipated a difficult difficulty in intubation in this patient who had a short neck and grade 4 malapatti we decided to do fob guided intubation under general anesthesia we used an intubation cover during induction to contain the aerosol after which the ent surgeon came in to do the fob the fob with endotracheal tube over it was introduced through one of the holes in the intubation cover and advanced orally to visualize the glottis and intubate the anesthetist is seen guiding the endotracheal tube inside the trachea looking at the mirror coming to covid positive patient scheduled for emergent surgery patient is kept in isolation ward where dedicated nurse with full ppe prepares the patient for surgery patient wearing a three ply mask is shifted to ot by the same nurse and a ward boy with full ppe the room corridor and the lift should be disinfected after patient transfer with 1% sodium hypochlorite for the floor and 25% besalol spray for other surfaces separate pathway and lift should be used exclusively for shifting covid patients same method of disinfection was followed after shifting the patient back to the ward precautions in ot negative pressure ot is ideal but we are using the next best lamina flow with hepa filter with 20 air exchanges per hour and humidity of 50 to 70 g per cubic meter this requires 25 minute minutes standing time between operations for covid negative patients and one hour for covid positive status if there is only one ot minimum ot personnel and equipment should be allowed no compromise on pp should be done high risk category personnel to be excluded from the ot exclusive covid theater is preferable patient is sent to ward after observation in the ot itself to avoid contamination in the recovery room pre operative assessment a thorough history regarding symptoms of the covid-19 and uh, uh, regarding the travel and uh, history of fever and other details should be obtained while clinically assessing the patient temperature blood pressure pulse rate and saturation has to be recorded auscultate for crepitations and wheezing check for breath holding time blood test chest x ray ecg and ct chest should be available and looked into assess the airway and formulate an airway plan assess severity of the respiratory system involvement mainly along with other other systems also regarding management during uh, anesthesia pre oxygenate with minimum gas flow of less than 6 liter per minute use rapid sequence intubation whenever possible low flow anesthesia and closed circuit system with closed circuit suctioning system for maintenance is preferable use intubation technique which you are familiar with 
employ lung protective mechanical ventilation strategies like tidal volume of 5 to 6 ml per kg and peak airway pressure to be kept below 30 cm of water. While emergence, use antiemetics to avoid vomiting and smooth emergence to, key, uh, to avoid coughing during extubation. Ensure complete recovery and adequate oxygenation before shifting the patient directly to the ward. Follow hand hygiene wherever necessary. After shifting the patient to the ward, disinfection of OT is done. 25% Bacillol is used for anesthesia machine, laryngoscope handle, IV stand, syringe pump, stethoscope, monitor with accessories, and PAPR. Soap and water can be used to clean laryngoscope blades, rubber face mask, magills, forceps, stilet, bougie, and face shields. The things that are disposed in the yellow bag are circuit, endotracheal tubes, airways, syringes, intubation covers, drapes, gloves and gowns, and hazmat suits. OT table, trolleys, microscope, walls, chair, OT lights are wiped with 25% Bacillol by the OT technician wearing a full PPE. OT floor is washed with soap and water and then mopped with 2% Bacillosid special. 20 ml of Bacillosid special is used in fogging machine to fumigate a 1000 cubic feet room. The room sealed and allowed to dry for one hour. No cases are posted in that OT for the next 24 hours. Deep burial is the recommended method of disposal of COVID positive biomedical waste. Coming to surgery and a local anesthesia, these are a few examples of ENT procedures done under local anesthesia. Middle ear, mastoid, nasal cavity, nasopharynx, oral cavity, and any airway procedure are considered aerosol producing surgery. They are preferably done under general anesthesia. Non aerosol producing surgeries can be done under local anesthesia. Advantages and disadvantages. The minimum number of personnel exposed and short duration of procedure and short hospital stay are the advantages. Disadvantages are the patient may cough, sneeze, talk or scream, thereby generating aerosols. Covering the patient's face as in general anesthesia is not possible because patient might feel uncomfortable and suffocated. Patient may fidget and move thus compromising the barrier. We may have to convert to general anesthesia in a non-cooperative patient and when surgery becomes more elaborate than initially planned. Patient's comfort and cost consideration, although important, take a lower priority than the safety of the personnel. If a procedure can be done under local anesthesia or general anesthesia, choose general anesthesia because of the better containment of aerosols. Working in ENT, Either way, working in ENT, is a spe ENT specialty is a boon for anesthetists because we have ENT surgeons on hand to help whenever extra hands are needed. We are fortunate to be working in NERF. CPR in suspected COVID-19, an interim update by American Heart Association. Minimizing provider exposure. All personnel should don PPE before entering a scene. Limited personnel should be present in the scene. Consider mechanical CPR in the place of manual CPR wherever feasible. COVID-19 status to be informed to any new personnel entering the scene or when the patient is shifted from the scenario to the hospital. Regarding oxygenation and ventilation strategies, use bag mask device with HEPA filter and tight seal for children. For adults, consider passive oxygenation with non-rebreathing face mask covered by surgical mask. If intubation is delayed, consider manual ventilation with laryngeal mask airway or bag mask device with HEPA filter. Patient is intubated with cuffed endotracheal tube connected to a ventilator with HEPA filter in the path of exhaled gas and inline suction catheter. Regarding starting or continuing CPR, triage the patient and do not risk personnel. Consider age, comorbidities, severity of illness in determining the appropriateness of resuscitation given that the mortality of critically ill COVID patients is high. Take home message, consider all COVID negative patients to be positive, exclusive OT for COVID positive patients. The main aim of the anesthetist is to prevent transmission by containing aerosols generated during anesthesia and to protect the patient and the personnel. General anesthesia with intubation is ideally preferred over 
local anesthesia general anesthesia with mask or lma is better avoided even for short procedures intubation and extubation take longer so a time allowance has to be made nabh guidelines regarding asepsis disinfection and biomedical waste management should be strictly adhered to even during covid days no method is full proof we follow all these which i have been talking keep innovating and improvising thank you i would like to thank iohns and johnson and johnson for arranging this webinar dr mohan sir for giving me this opportunity to speak about anesthesia in a ent forum all the staff at the murf especially the anesthesia team for the full support and last but not the least all the viewers of this webinar thank you thank you very much uh, satya for the wonderful uh, presentation it was very comprehensive and i think you covered all aspects from a to z uh, you know you you have uh, you, thank you thank you satya uh, thank you. it was a wonderful presentation and i yes, think sir, it was yes. very comprehensive you covered all aspects right from the word go from the time the patient is seen from the prs at the clinic right to the time you send him back to the ward you gone through it so i'm sure there are a lot of questions which are going to be coming so we'll you know address them as they come but uh, i think there is uh, some more uh, material to be added uh, to your presentation i think one of the uh, uh, panelists uh, i think it is going to be uh, uh, i think we are going to have now uh, some more uh, slides to be added on and uh, if i'm not mistaken dr goswami has uh, a few slides which he would like to share with us uh, can i request dr dinesh goswami from uh, nightingale hospital in uh, gohati to, to show his uh, presentation and dr uh, sir so all of us can mute our mics please dr goswami kindly unmute your mic hello yes dr dinesh can please go ahead yeah i uh, thank you dr satyabhama for the nice presentation you have covered almost uh, all aspects of ent anesthesia in the covid time and uh, we in nightingale hospital actually we have uh, <clears throat> doing uh, when uh unlocking started the cases and here the most important aspect is that to prevent the contagion so because this virus is um, highly contagious and there is risk for the anesthesia team as well as the surgeons and here the importance is that the whole team should understand that uh, we are Uh, everyone is safe not infected so with that uh, objective keeping in mind so one of the things that comes up is that the expired air that uh, the patient exhales so how they are to be handled so uh, in our setup we have devised one system like you no know, uh, dr gautam khan will be sharing the slides Uh, this is actually which is coming up now is uh, a sort of a scavenging system which is available in one of the hospitals where we both of us practice and this is an improved system uh, with laminar gas flow so if it is available then it is good and if not uh, there are other uh, improvised techniques also that you can adopt so like like this Gautam, can you please go to the next slide? The next one. So here in uh, Nightingale Hospital, we have a uh, ventilator which uh, actually 
uh, not a low flow type we have, we need to give high flow so we uh, de devise the technique uh, so that the the uh, expert guesses are being taken out through a corrugated tube and then uh, through a sort of a <clears throat> um outlet it is taken away to outside of course we are not putting that sodium hypochlorite on the way uh, but the thing is that at least we are to manage uh, the infection within the ot so during induction also we put that thing uh, into uh, we put the thing into uh, that uh, 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 tubing so that the expired air is also being sucked out and while in ventilation that time also. And also we uh, devise like you know, Dr. Satyabhama showed to us uh, sort of a transparent um, seat putting over the patient during intubation and also during excavation. So uh, I'm sorry that the slides are not coming up properly. And uh, uh, the importance here is actually uh, we, the, every member in the team, they should understand that this infection. So donning and doffing is very important. And as told that rapid sequence intubation that we do in almost all the cases, Till now, we are not uh, uh, needed to take up any COVID patient, but uh, as the time moves on, we are not so sure because infection in uh, Guwahati city as well as in Assam is now rising. So in the days to come, probably we need to uh, fa face that type of patient as well for emergency surgeries. And for those, uh, we need to uh, take up the guidelines that is given by the local health authority. And another important aspect here, uh, I think that we need to consider the disinfection of the patient. As you know, the ENT uh, operation areas, the nose, the throat, the mouth, oral cavity, it harbors a lot of bacteria and the viruses. And so also the, in uh, those cases, asymptomatic cases may be put up for uh, elective surgeries. They may also harbor some form of virus. So in that case, actually, if we preoperatively prepare the patient uh, so that uh, there is evidence that uh, um, this uh, chlorohexidine, chlorohexidine can uh, control the, uh, the quantum of viruses that are there in the oral cavity as well as the nasal cavity. So if we uh, treat the patient preoperatively, that may reduce the virus or bacterial burden. So with this and having a good communication within the whole team, we can achieve the difficulty that we are facing now in the surgeries that we are doing in the ENT practice. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Goswami. I think it was a uh, you know, useful addition to the importance of scavenging and, and how we have worked on a, a simple uh, technique, uh, homemade technique. Now, uh, I, I, I would like to now start the question. The first question I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Jagannath. Uh, who's probably the senior most person here. He's got about 50 years of uh, anesthesia practice. He's seen a lot in his uh, career. So, Dr. Jagannath, you have been working all over the world. You have uh, worked in many, uh, you know, national and international crisis situations. So, have you seen anything like this before, you know, and, and I want your, your, uh, uh, your uh, perspective on What's going on? Has it changed anesthesia uh, forever? Has it changed medicine forever? Or what is your take on it? Jagannath, can you unmute the talk? Thank you, Mohan, for this uh, quite wonderful question. 
but it's a period of time I have been in this profession as an anesthesiologist, and I have gone through ages of uh, the types of anesthesia. Now, what I what I started my life and what I am seeing right today, right at this present moment, is something dramatic. I have never visualized that this could be happening in this era itself. Uh, it was so simple and easy, putting a tube and just bagging. Hello, can you hear me, please? Yes, yes. Go ahead. Please. Yeah, yeah. The thing is, uh, I, I, when I started my anesthesia career, it was so simple, and I have never thought that it is going to come to this extent. But one thing I was always worried was that uh, uh, saving a life was the ultimate. So whether it was the beginning of my career or during that time, or even at the present with COVID, I think saving life has been the watchword for every each and every anesthetist. And that has been the principle in my whole career. So what I feel the change is, it's now becoming more dramatic and it's also acting not only on the physical psyche of an anesthetist, but also on the mental psyche of the anesthetist. Every day entering into, a, into, a, a, into the operation theater is something at the present juncture is like entering a battleground where there are two generals. One is the general ENT and another, I use a pun, is general anesthesia or the general anesthetist. So every day anything can happen and every case, as you rightly say, even in your surgeries are different. So what I feel is that this is not going to end here. The change which I'm going to see further will be that there will be still more things to come up with this present problems uh, when things are, will really go bad. And uh, I really don't wish to see that. But for me, it has been a dramatic change uh, from the time I started till now. And every time there was something new coming up. Well, when I started, I used to just back for hours together for a major case. Now we have these ventilators and a workstation. Now, most probably in futuristic plans, these uh, workstations may come out with a, in a, a scavenging system. Everything will be automatic and everything will be comfortable. So I think there will be scope for improvement. Maybe this was a small kick for, for us to restart our thinking and go a little bit ahead of what is, uh, what is going to happen in future. So I think there is a dramatic change. I can only say that. And uh, I, it's, uh, I don't know whether I was lucky enough to see this change, but definitely I didn't wouldn't like to see this drastic change as an anesthetist, wherein I used to walk in into the theater with uh, my dress. And now I see like a space suit being put for an anesthetist. I really pity all the anesthetists working and my colleagues. Mm -hmm. It's really very difficult to work in such situations where even your saturation may come down with putting so many of us especially a 3M and other masks. And I, I only hope futuristic that something much better will be provided not only for the anesthetists, but also for the surgeons to go ahead with their work. Thank you, Maud. Thank you so much, Rajana. Very, very uh, well said, you know, very important words there. So, you know, your, your perspective is important that we ultimately all of us are trying to save lives. Only slight difference now, I think, is from trying to save lives of patients we also Added on to that list of lives, the personnel also. Yes. So, right, so right. that's the only difference, yes. So, you know, it's a very difficult time, and I think we are all going through hell. But uh, I, I'm reminded of uh, the famous words of Sir Winston Churchill uh, in, you know, when, in the Second World War, when things were really going bad for Britain, and it looked as though Britain was on the verge of collapse. And somebody asked him uh, for his opinion. Sir Winston Churchill said, if you're going through hell, keep going, you know, so that that's uh, that applies very much to all of us now. So we are going through hell, but I think the way out of it is to keep going, you know, not to go back. So okay. that's an important uh, message for us. Now, I have a, a question, you know, I have been listening to a few webinars from uh, anesthetists, from, you know, a few international webinars, in fact, and I was quite surprised to hear some senior anesthetists making a comment, and also certain senior surgeons, uh, ENT surgeons making a comment saying that local anesthesia is preferable over general anesthesia. In fact, uh, this has uh, been said uh, in not one, but more than one webinars, even by very eminent uh, anesthetists from the Royal College of Anesthesia and so on. I was quite surprised, and 
today we heard exactly the opposite statement made by dr sateva ma he said when well, you can do a ga please do ga you know because it cuts cuts down aerosol uh, contamination so obviously even amongst the anesthetic community there is this dichotomy you know some of them believe that uh, you know if you can do a local anesthesia do it so that we are all going to be outside the theater and we are safe you guys can get contaminated that's your job to go or you know the other aspect is that okay no let's do a ga and save everybody including a and surgeon even though they are giving us bad time you know we still uh, like to keep them safe so what is your take on it i would like to ask uh, first of all i would like to ask babita uh, babita what do you think is it la or ga what do you, where is your vote can you unmute okay. and talk babita see it is uh, this is exactly what you said the the practice is changing the norms are changing so if uh, uh, it is preferred it is preferred to be ga currently now how do i say they are uh, they are trying to generate uh, create uh, and generate evidence leap besides in covid we may not be able to generate evidence as much as we want but yes uh, it is uh, all the guidelines uh, after sitting and having the expert opinion if we talk about ministry of health and family welfare guidelines on safe and safe uh, ent practices they have come up with nearly 16 page document which all of you would have gone through that uh, and royal college in fact so norms are changed here if it is preferred then preferred is la until unless preferred is sorry ga until unless contraindicated okay that's very clear so you are you are definitely there what about anand i can see anand putting up his hand yeah dr anand sharma please unmute your mic please and then talk to mic okay can you hear me yes so uh, uh, professor mon what you heard about the ga versus la abroad was a overall kind of opinion saying that regional is better definitely it is better but we are looking at the ent context now think about two surgeries right for example one is a local tracheostomy you do that under a local the patient coughs sprays the whole ot and everyone around them unless you're careful even in the best of hands there is going to be a spray look at the other side there's a lymph node biopsy that you need to take from the scalp or post auricular lymph node that you need Uh, that needs excision for a biopsy which can be safely done in a patient who is unlikely to cough unlikely to stimulate his airway you can put a three ply mask on him stay away from him as much as possible so the context with regional versus general depends on the surgery concern now most for most parts the decision or the opinion that regional is safer is not based on ent per se and airway surgery for that there is i would say there is unhesitatingly Uh, even in the government documents in all on the difficult airway society they actually have written clear instructions that for example if you need to do a tracheostomy in a difficult airway in a stridorous patient see if you can give, if you can give him a ga first but if it was a total knee replacement if it was a hernia if it was a prostate for example mm -hmm. then you have a choice that if you give him a regional you will stay away from the patient cover them with a mask the surgeons are away the ot staff are away the spread of covid the virus is going to be much less so basically it's context specific and even within ent practice and head and neck practice if you can get away with it you you need to look at the patient and the surgery itself and if you can get away with it look certainly regional because there's much less viral load and you're not having to deal with the problems of intubation and extubation which is going to expose the whole ot and the rest of the staff but if not then certainly a general anesthesia mm -hmm. so it's it's kind of tailor made to the individual patient yeah the point very well taken but But let me ask you a little more. Now, even if, let's say, take the example you gave. Let's take a total knee replacement. You know, even there, uh, you know, even though you have the option of doing a regional anesthesia, would it not be safer to say that you know an intubated patient who is connected to a closed circuit would be much less of a risk to the personnel than a person who's just got a three-ply mask and you know because you can't obviously. the cover is whole face with the plastic hood or something so he still has a small risk of you know coughing or sneezing you can't really is control that so wouldn't a ga be still preferred that's a fair question the thing is that he may cough or he may sneeze but if you i give him a general anesthetic the only time he's going to be really safe is from the moment i inflate the cuff on the tube till the moment i deflate the cuff on the tube that is the only time the ot is going to be safe 
during induction if i need more than one attempt during extubation if he starts coughing more than usual and honestly in ent practice in general anesthesia practice we cannot do without the cuff we need to make sure the airway is safe before we can actually shift the patient out especially since these days we can't we don't have the luxury of a post op where you can observe a patient you need to make sure that most of them are going back to the ward in the hands of sisters who are not trained to manage airways so in that case you're only safe for that one or two hours but the induction and the reversal which is going to increase that spray of covid is still going to be there i'll just then this is everyone else wants that or yes yeah yeah but i just but babita please go ahead yes yeah i'll just say because i have just said in between see i fully agree that it is surgery context and it is the patient context which is going to decide individual basis for the ga versus la but what i was talking in uh, uh, in broad perspective specific to ent and uh, ent practice and specific to the the procedures which are to be taken in the main surgical theater and the procedures which are going to be aerosol generating procedures over there uh, that as because broadly we cannot say it's okay la for every patient or ga for every patient but as in context with anand anand mentioned that if it is a, a, a so uh, uh, the neck a uh, nodal biopsy why not do it in the G, uh, local definitely in fact it is recommended that any uh, biopsy like uh, now we know that neck nodal biopsy takes over in ent practice rather than doing an indirect laryngoscopy to find out something okay if the patient has a neck node and you are assessing the patient for Uh, uh for indirect laryngoscopy for the carcinoma larynx the neck nodal biopsy outside so our purpose is to have as less as aerosol generating processes as possible now to the context of uh, uh, which is not the in the preview of this uh, webinar but to the context of a uh, tkr or total knee replacement um ga versus la uh i understand that professor mohan uh, has a concept that why not ga and anand mentioning that you are safe from the time the cough till the cough is deflated no you are not also safe during that time because during that time if by any chance your patient goes into lighter plane of anesthesia and has uh, uh, say has that's again uh, we as an anesthesiologist will not let it do, go but then if patient develops uh, uh, some um, sputum endotracheally so you're not safe even during that time so having regional anesthesia in that scenario is much better because you have you are not doing any active intervention in the airway in that patient where you can prefer regional like in tkr so you are not uh, doing because doing uh, intubation you may do suctioning so i am not talking about any other surgery so i am focusing myself to the ent perspective in this webinar yeah, yeah. well yes absolutely point taken so we are focusing on the ent yeah, that's true i just wanted to ask you this question now uh, is 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 there also this the opinion of uh, the other anesthetists dr pradeep gangadharan uh dinesh uh, any or anything to add to this we all agreed that uh, in ent you would prefer a general anesthesia to local anesthesia yeah okay right then uh, dr handa please uh, see uh, there cannot be anything in black and white there are uh, ministry of health guidelines but as i said before as we have evolved we see uh, ent surgeries like stepidectomy tympanoplasty now these are again outside the aerosol generating area the process of anesthesia intubation extubation is likely to uh, generate more aerosol than uh, the odd risk of a patient during uh, stepidectomy coughing or sneezing so we have to uh, prioritize but uh, mls cannot be done under local anesthesia so it has to be surgery specific again the crux all over today is rather than uh, is the protection the protection of the patient yeah. the protection of the personnel that should be almost touching a uh, yeah. a very good standard fair enough yes i think that's a very important point so now i want to you know uh, ask the surgeons a question now 
you know, we've all been talking about uh, deferring uh, elective surgeries and uh, only taking up emergencies. And at least that's been going on for the first uh, couple of months, two or three months. And in fact, in many centers, even now, there are many surgeons who are very hesitant to take up elective surgeries. So, although I know that people like you, uh, Handa or Manoj or uh, Naresh Panda, even both them, you all started doing uh, you know, surgeries now gradually. Uh, as I said earlier, in a, in a, in a uh, you know, phased manner, and also in a responsible manner. So I think these are two important words which are now coming in. So elective surgery is to be started in a phased manner and in a responsible fashion. So now uh, that being the case, you see, I have always had this uh, nagging doubt in my mind. We always talk about two aspects of surgery. One is how emergent it is. And second, what is its propensity for aerosol generation? Now, when it comes to ENT, the, unfortunately, the two seem to be working, you know, at cross purposes. That is, almost all the emergencies that we have had to deal with are the aerosol generating procedures. And the, it is the elective procedures which have less aerosol generation capacity. For example, a tracheostomy is a very high uh, risk for aerosol generation. Whereas if you are uh, doing a stepidectomy, you know, it's far less uh, propensity for aerosol generation. So what is the logic in asking people to only doing emergencies which are very high risk aerosol producers and hold on to the low risk procedures like uh, sepidotomy uh, and endlessly delay? Now, I, it doesn't make any sense to me at least. So I let me ask you whether it makes any sense to anyone of you. What's the logic behind it? Let me start with Naresh Pandal. Uh, yeah, uh, I think um, my opinion is a bit different. For the simple reason that you know we are passing through a very difficult phase we are loaded with cases who, who require emergent services uh, as far as surgeries are concerned and then you know we have to look after them first followed by the ones who can wait you know that's what we have categorized our surgical procedures say like that you know we do the emergency semi emergencies the time sensitive and then the ones which are which can wait for the simple reason that you know we we are going through a phase when we are subjecting these patients for a covid testing and uh, they have to be negative and then you know we take them for surgery our workload is already there why do elective surgeries in this setting so that's that's the concern which we have uh, you know here and that's the reason that you know we are not doing the elective surgeries tympanoplasty can safely wait you know for 2 3 months without any uh, you know, geopardization of his uh, quality of life. A stepidectomy, you know, he has been having hearing loss for a while. He can wait for two to three months before the curve flattens. We can always take him up. But that's my take on, on the elective procedures. And um, as far as if, suppose if delaying our procedure uh, makes makes little difficult, uh, quality uh, suffers for the patient, I think I won't have any hesitation in taking this patient for surgery. I, I'm not going to leave you there, Naresh. I'm going to ask you another very uh, unpleasant yes. question. Now, uh, are you so optimistic that in two to three months' time things are going to be different, or what if this uh, goes on for two years? What happens? Then? Yeah, I think I, I think Dr. Handa very in the initial phase said that you know the things are changing. What we discussed a month back has may have changed. What we are discussing today may may change after a month's time. We don't know. I think I, the big the the answer is that we don't know as what is going to happen. But suppose you know, but hopefully you know things always change for better. I am optimistic that another three to four months time, I think I'm sure the curve is going to flatten. Oh, so, okay. When are you going to reassess this whole situation? When are you going to say okay, post stepidotomies? Maybe another two months time. Two months. Okay, fine. All right, good. Now, let me ask Manoj. Manoj, what is your take on this? And I know you're doing uh, elective surgeries now in a yeah. very phased manner. So, how are, how are you? Uh, what is your take on this? Are you, you, my original question was, emergencies seem to be I higher mean. risk uh, for, for personnel, uh, for aerosol generation, than elective procedures. What's the logic in uh, delaying electives? Uh, you're dead right, Mohan. I think you have a real point there. Because see, um, I mean, like what you said, I don't think these things are going to change in, in three months or six months or even a year. I think we're here for a long haul. Uh, it is not going to happen immediately. So what do we get? Like, like you said, if we postpone the surgery, what exactly do we gain? 
like when you do a tuminoplasty or a stabilectomy under general anesthesia and with using proper precautions, we are not really risking anyone. That said, uh, I think you, whatever the anesthesia, the talk that we saw in the morning, if you, you have to learn to understand that these are things that you're going to, dealing with, going to be dealing with for a very long period of time. You got to be taking precautions. You got to be limiting your theater. Like we used to be operating on four or five days a week. Now we are doing only two days a week and we are posting only minimum required cases. We are giving enough time between cases, but work has to go on. You know, when you, when you run, run a hospital like ours, uh, maybe when, like uh, what Naresh said in PGI, it may be a different uh, scene altogether. But in a place like ours, we need to keep on working. And that is because people do come to us and there are problems, they need to be, they are discharging years, there are years with a lot of problems, there's children who can't study. Um, of course, cochlear implants and the like. So we need to understand that if we change our way of working, we should be able to do this safely without any additional risk to the patient and to the um, caregivers themselves. You know, support, just making sure that the patient themselves are not under risk or are your uh, staff under risk? I think if you take both into consideration, uh, I think this is the time when we have to understand that we need to work uh, in a phased manner, in a limited manner, but nevertheless, uh, not saying no to any surgery. Thank you, Nara. Thank you, Manoj. That's uh, wonderful. Now, uh, let me let me go to uh, Gautam. Uh, Gautam, uh, what is your uh, policy on this? Now, when I, are you doing electives now? Uh, when are you start? When did you start, or when are you starting? And what is your take on this? You know, my also question was, you know, emergencies if we can do, why not do electives? You know, the emergencies are higher risk. But Naresh uh, Parta have made the point, a very valid point. That you know, in a department is overloaded with uh, every case coming in and a lot number of elective emergencies coming in, then maybe you're delaying uh, your elective because you're you're just giving time for the emergencies to be tackled first. So let me ask uh, the you know the Gautam Pound from uh, Gohati, what is your take on this, Gautam? Sir, thank you, sir. First of all, and uh, what Doctor Na. Naresh Panda sir has said is very correct for their sort of scenario where in a public sector hospital where they will have definitely a huge load of patients. Definitely they will have to look at the emergencies first. But uh, like in our situation when we are working in a private setup, yes, as you said, initially we were doing only the emergencies and as you have rightly mentioned, the emergencies were all aerosol generating. Like we are doing a bronchial foreign body, it's aerosol generating. We are doing a tracheostomy, it's aerosol generating. We have started doing for the last one month or so, uh, regular ENT surgeries, tympanoplasties, even mastoids, as well as adenoids, etc. But we, as a, just like Dr. Manikot said, we are spacing the surgeries. We are not taking up too many surgeries. And we also have to counsel the patients that their cost is going to increase because of the use of PPEs and etc. Uh, we have to tell them that uh, if you wish to wait, it's up to you. Since it's elective surgery, we give them the option. We counsel them well. And if after that they want to get uh, go ahead with the surgery, we are doing it with the necessary. Of course, in our state, we are slightly better off till date because we have had only 10 deaths and we had 6,000 positive cases, 4,000 have been discharged. So our situation is not as bad as, say, in certain say, parts of India. So we are not as scared to go ahead, but we are taking all the precautions. And last time when we met sir on a webinar, we had mentioned that we had, did not have the facility for doing COVID uh, RT-PCR privately, but off late we are having that facility as well. So we are following your principle. We admit the patient the day before surgery, send him for the COVID testing, and the patient is not discharged and the patient undergoes the surgery and is discharged late. Thank you, sir. That's, that's, that's very common. Now coming to you raised an important point, and I'm going to ask this, throw this question to the anesthesia panel. You know, the cost of uh, all this, you know, somebody is going to be, there's nothing like a free lunch, you know, so everyone is, everything is going to be voted for. So, you know, in an institutional setup like PGI, for example, you know, it may not bite them immediately, but in the private sector, it's certainly going to be biting the patient now. So all this, uh, you know, the, the PPE, the hazmat suits for the uh, surgical team, for the anesthetic team, the, you know, the uh, uh, aerosol protection uh, covers or boxes or whatever, and the scavenging system and everything is ultimately is going to be passed on to the patient. So, you know, how, what is the sort of policy that you have? 
I mean, uh, what, what, um, what I, I would like to have some figures from you, you know, so what are we going to be putting on the patient per patient? What are we going to be saying is additional cost you know, for, for all this? Let me start off with uh, uh, Dr. Anand Sharma. You know, in, 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 uh, what is the policy in Vedanta? You know, are you charging extra to the patient for all this uh, COVID protection gear and so on? So for, there were certain things that have already pre-existing, like scavenging systems were already around in Vedanta. Uh, the main bulk of patient cost from the anesthesia side is going to be the disposables. So, which are actually covered, which have to be paid up by the patient, even in case they come in from a panel from airlines or others. So, ballpark figure from an anesthesia side for an average patient, we would require around two to three disposables. Generally two, because those are the numbers issued to the anesthesia side. We only have one anesthetist and one technician in the OT. We tend to keep our juniors out and there's someone standing outside the door in case we need them. So if basically that's a third suit in case we need them, otherwise two disposable per patient. The ones we have are the Romson suits, which are costing around a thousand to 1200. So I would say that that is kind of increasing. Already they were paying for the disposables. Uh, the current disposable cost has gone up by around three to 4,000 because there are certain other things like trolley covers or the the CM cover that we're using to protect against the aerosol, which are also getting included in this. So around three to 4,000 for disposable. The rest, we al already had a system in place. Thank you so much. Uh, can I ask Dr. Uh, Gangadran and, uh, you know, uh, what, what is your take? Now, in, in Messier, uh, what is the policy? How, how are you covering this cost for uh, these patients, you know, using all the disposables and protective gear? Dr. Gangadhar, can you unmute, please? Please, can you unmute and then stop? Okay. Can you? Yes. Uh, in our hospital, uh, there is no. Uh, we are using um, plastic uh, cover. Right. It is a very. It is very cheap, and the aerosol uh, contamination can be prevented by using this thing. On either side of the plastic cover, we are mm, making two holes and integrating the patient inside the plastic cover. And uh, no additional uh, charges are required for this. And uh, all other things are uh, in the usual protocol. Then under the usual uh, disposables are uh, all, all patients, uh, all doctors and staffs are using PP kits. And minimum number of persons are there to work with effective men. As I understand it, the, the hospital is absorbing the cost. Yes, yes. Okay, okay. No, okay. No, no. Can I can I interrupt? Yeah, yeah, no, no, yes, sorry. Yes, yes. Uh, see, the thing is what uh, Dr. Gangaran uh, probably uh, want to say is that we've been using disposables for the time that we, uh, we that we began. You know, uh, we have always been using hundred percent disposables from the very beginning. So we were always using disposable aprons, disposable gloves, disposable bed sheets. So um, we never really had to change much uh, when the COVID came. All we needed, instead of what we're using disposable theater dress, we are using PPEs now. So the additional cost is very slight and we really are not passing that on to the patient. No, but if you're going to be using hazmat suits, for example, Manoj, would you? Uh, yes, Mohan, the hazmat suit that we are getting, anyway, uh, I do not know whether, see, we're getting it from a company called Encore, which, uh, which is a ISO 9001 certified company. We're getting it at 600 rupees uh, each. Uh, this contains the full zip up hazmat suit with the head cover. It, can, it has got a 95 mask and it's got shoe covers as well. So now that vis-a-vis -vis what we're using the earlier theater that it used to come to 450, it's not a big uh, difference if I look at it that way. Uh, so because we've been buying from these people for a very long time, um, we've been getting this good rate. I don't know how the 1,200 thing came, but uh, we've been getting it at 650 each, which uh, which I think is something that we need to absorb at this point of time when okay. everybody is in financial trouble. Okay. Right. Now, uh, so in fact, uh, the uh, other question that I now want to ask, you know, it is, you know, the... We saw in Satyabama's presentation a very important statement which she made. Uh, sorry, Pavitra, you want to say something? Yes. Sir, I want to say, you started uh, with the note that uh, uh, being the PGI, the cost may not bite the PGI. 
staff or PGI people, I would you all have presented an aspect of the corporate setup where you would ask uh, the patient to pull in the extra uh, whatever cost they have. And each patient would be pulling in, say, 600, 450, XYZ. But you are not looking at the other aspect in the institute. In institute, cost bite us more than the corporate setup. Why? Because in institute, we are uh, dependent on government to make us the PPE available, purchase through that long process. And at times, we are uh, at a you know we are at the worst position than the uh, corporate setup because the things would move fast in the corporate setup. It takes us, uh, Dr. Panda can vouch that we had to beg for N95 masks. We cannot buy on our own because it is not available and left over in the in the market. Uh, Gem portal and the government has bought all those then. We cannot get it in the donation because it is not allowed. And we cannot get it from the government because it is not moving fast. So it is biting us in a bigger way. In fact, that is a major reason for us not to start a routine uh, out of the other reason. Yes, we don't want to start and we want to start in the phasic session and we are going slow. But uh, our availability of uh, a lot of uh, PPE to us is at all different levels of PPE, be it a level one or a level two, we have a difficulty in arranging and getting it. So it is biting us in a bigger way than in the corporate, corporate setup. Yeah, I, I, I fully agree with you. I, in fact, I fully agree with you. In fact, it's the same situation everywhere, all over the country. In fact, you know, in, in Chennai, we had at one stage a very unfortunate uh, situation where we saw all the politicians walking around with N95 masks and all the frontline COVID uh, doctors going around without masks, N95 masks. And it reached a stage where the junior doctors, you know, threatened to go on strike unless they were given N95 masks. And only at that stage, after the press coverage and everything, then, you know, they started getting it. So I, I fully agree. I, this is not, a, you know, the on the one side, you know, health workers, I, everybody will be lighting lamps and clapping uh, from their balconies. On the other side, you know, there's no one to really look at their plight. So it's like sending uh, an army to fight a battle without uh, proper, uh, you know, uh, uh, artillery. So I, I agree with you. you know, it's, it's a very in sad fact, yeah. No, but in uh, fact, I think uh, Dr. Mohan, uh, if I can interject, I think uh, things are, uh, I mean, like in a government setup, things are uh, maybe difficult in the in the initial phases, but. I think these uh, the things are improving. The the supplies are also increasing now. The difficulties are getting less and less. I think, I mean, it's not that uh, gloomy a picture which was earlier. I mean, things are definitely improving. We have started getting things. Uh, and I'm sure, I mean, like, um, you know, uh, the, the the silver lining is that all the patients are being, uh, who are being treated for uh, being admitted for uh, COVID positivity and other Issues are being treated free, of course. You know that's that's a great way of uh, going ahead. So I think the things are definitely better. I mean, initially there were some hiccups, but I think definitely things have improved. Yeah. Uh, uh, can I also add in something? Yes. Uh, in the last one or two weeks, now the market uses there is oversupply of PPEs, and the costs have come down. So it is for up for us to bargain. Now, what Dr. Anand told was the anesthesia requirement. There is a surgical requirement. There is some other. So, if you take a surgery cost, your question is very direct. Add on about 8 to 10 percent cost more uh, in a COVID era. It should cover everything. Regarding the non availability, even our institutions, there was a lot of resistance in the beginning. But once you put your foot down, yeah, and that is true for institutions also, government sector also, where it is taxpayers' money, they will give it. We have to just put our foot correctly what we need. And today, I don't think it should be a limiting factor for uh, for our service uh, starting. If somebody is hindering it, there are several ways of doing it. Even in a corporate sector, we put up enough pressure. They said no N95 masks, ENT surgeries are not high-risk surgeries, but we have to give literature, we have to exert a pressure group, and then everything comes in the correct way. So, And even the pharmaceutical companies, my appeal, Janssen is there, there are others. Please take hold of hospitals who really need. Put in some money for your PP kit, uh, N95 masks. These don't cost much. Uh, N95 ma mask in bulk is today 50, 60 rupees. But if you can give them to hospitals which need, the short of that, that will be a very good gesture. Thank you. That's a very important point. Now, can I ask all of you, you know, uh, 
uh, are these uh, covered by insurance? I mean, if you're if a patient, uh, our calculation is that you know even if you include the preoperative COVID testing and so on, a patient's burden of uh, cost is going to go up by anything uh, you know almost up to eight to ten thousand rupees for any procedure. If you include the pre-op COVID testing cost also into that, if the patient has to do for. So now in, in under those circumstances. If uh, it, will this be covered by insurance at the present cost? You know, does the insurance cover this, or does the patient end up paying for this? What is what is the uh, you know what is your experience with it? Because there's no nothing seems to be uniform in the country. Some some get on, some don't. The general trend is if you put a justifiable expense in terms of say a couple of masks or a PPE. Insurance companies don't object, but if you put up huge, huge uh, bills, then the problem starts. So at our end, we have to be uh, putting up a justifiable number, and most of the uh, insurance companies let it pass. Now, there's one question which has come from uh, the audience is uh, from a very eminent ENT surgeon, Dr. Seema Sheikh from Pune. Now, he, he, it's a general question, you know, and he's saying that since we have evidence that uh, post-op issues with surgeries uh, is more COVID era now, and the complications are more post-op. So under the circumstances, why not delay elective surgery? Because Manoj's point is well taken because he's in Kerala, which is relatively better off than the rest of the country, but Simab is in Pune, and he says Pune is burning as is Mumbai. Uh, so is it sensible in our areas? Because don't we have to take the community statistics into view when deciding about the uh, you know, the starting electives. In keeping in mind that uh, the complication rate can go up in these patients. And if these patients in the post-operative period contract or COVID infection, it could be worse. So what is the answer to that? See, if I can, uh, the, no, uh, Mohan, yeah. I think, uh, I mean, like uh, Dr. Simab's point is uh, logical for the simple reason that many a times what is happening is, suppose if we like a case happened in, um, you know, a patient was um, asking for surgery for a heart wall replacement. He was asked to get a COVID testing done. COVID testing was negative. He was admitted. And a cardiological evaluation was sought for before taking this patient off for surgery. And uh, the COVID test came negative, uh, positive again. So once negative, second time positive, And once positive, this patient started deteriorating. You know, so he was asymptomatic to begin with, got his COVID testing done, COVID testing was negative, came to the hospital for his surgery, was the COVID test came positive later on. Now, these are the situations when you are taking, you know, particularly when, the, as you said, the, the, the situation in a particular geographic region is different from, you know, in every part of our country. So in a, in a place where, you know, the, the, the infection is more severe, I think one has to be really very careful in doing elective cases and um, and, and, and and take uh, measured uh, steps. Right. Now, on the same topic... Can I say something, Manoj? Uh, Manoj, yeah, please go ahead. Um, see, the uh, I think Seema was referring to those uh, uh, papers that mentioned a higher risk of mortality and morbidity following uh, COVID. Yes. And if you look at the papers, they were actually not well uh, studied. No, they, it was not actually a fair comparison. I would say that a lot of bias went into it. Um, see, people, if you look at those papers, they have, they have combined the statistic of somebody with having multiple comorbidities, dangerous surgeries, with somebody having um, uh, minor surgeries. You can't do a comparison like that. It is, it is, it is very unfair to do such a comparison. So uh, definitely, uh, I, I don't think the risk is so great that you have to deny somebody who needs a surgery. But, but the point is very well taken that in a place like Kerala, I'm much more safer off. We still in Calicut are having very, very low number of COVID patients. There is no compute spread at all. But I think you need to uh, tailor it according to what your uh, particular situations are. But I, but uh, like Seema um, said, um, the precautions that you take, I think, has to vary from place to place. Right. Now, this is another very interesting comment from Dr. Sunil Goyal from the Armed Forces. Uh, you know, basically, what he's saying is we are doing two COVID tests on day zero and day seven. If both are negative, then we take up the surgery as earlier without even you know, full PPE protection. We just like regular gown and mask and, and uh, 
triple layer mask and then do the surgery. Not worried about hazmat suits and things. So two tests, both negatives, day zero, day seven. And then if it both are negative, it takes them off for surgery. But Naresh Patna, would you agree with this? Yes, we are doing the same. Right. And in fact, uh, you know, uh, when when this uh, now that we have started doing elective surgeries, patients are approaching us through teleconsultation, tele registration. They are asking us, and if if we have to do, we ask them if we can get one test COVID testing done. And then uh, mm. they get a, another test done, and the surgery is done within 24 to 48 hours after the second COVID testing. We take usual precautions without without using the PPEs which are, have to be used for a COVID patient. Yeah. So our no, approach, sorry, yes, our approach is slightly different. We do the test, and uh, within a week, if the patient is asymptomatic, we take him up for surgery. In case he develops symptoms, then we go for a second test. Just the logistics, because getting a test also costs some money. Both again, of, uh, there is a 30% chance of a positive, a negative test uh, still carrying on. So, and there is a window period. There is a, a window period of the infection coming in. So we have to balance between the practicality and the safety. That on the side good. of safety, but. Yeah. Now, my, my point is, you see, we all like, we know that there's a 30 percent false negative uh, rate for like in uh, in the best of institutions for RT PCR. So, you know, you do two tests. Okay, you have a 30 percent uh, false negative first time, and the second time it comes down to 10 percent. But you still have a 10 percent, you know, false negative uh, result, even if you do two tests. So, are you still absolutely clear about not using, uh, you know, full protection? Can you just go ahead, or do you still think we need to use a full protection even in that those circumstances? Full protection is required in any our ENT procedures. I think the full PP kit should be used. Anything in the oral cavity or airway. External sur surgeries may be elective. Uh, it is left up to the uh, at least the person or the surgeon. But in the airway, the full protection should be. I think yeah, I think I would agree with you. So even if we do two tests, I would still urge that in a in a high risk aerosol generating procedures, you know, the surgeon has to, and the anesthetic team have to protect themselves. So it, 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 uh, I think uh, we need to be, you know, more careful. But to her on the set of caution, I feel, you know, till this whole thing is uh, sorted out. Now uh, the other uh, question is about the rapid antigen tests, you know, which ICMR is now promoting and it's a big advantage because you don't have to be waiting for a full day for the test kit to you know, get the results. You do it uh, and you get the results in 20 minutes or 30 minutes. So some of the hospitals have started doing it there and for emergencies. You know, patients are coming in for an emergency to me, just have 20-30 minutes by the time he gets his ECG and uh, you know, blood test done, you can you've done the rapid antigen test. What is your take on this? Let me let me ask uh, let first start up with uh, Pumod and then ask Resh Panda. Manoj, let's ask about them. See, the gold standard is RT-PCR. Uh, rapid antigen is a adjunct. Suppose at times in RT-PCR, you get inconclusive. So then our uh, our microbiologists, they they go for a rapid antigen and give us a report. But still, the, that confidence is not there in the rapid antigen test as in a RT-PCR. I'm talking about an emergency format where you don't have time for the RT-PCR. Yes, so it is better than doing nothing. Okay. It doesn't match up to the standards of RT-PCR. Okay. So even if you had a negative from RT-PCR, you would still think, uh, you know, take all the precautions. Yes, we will take all the precautions. I think that should be, the stage is coming where we cannot get testing done for everything. What is happening in our hospital, even say for a CT scan, they, some people started asking for a RT-PCR or a echocardiography, they started asking. Any FNAC, they started asking. So we have to come at a consensus. What is the best benchmark. Okay. Uh, is, is that also the opinion of other other surgeons in the panel? Anyone has any differing opinions? Uh, I fully agree with him, Mamon. I'm completely in agree, agreement with Dr. Handa. Right. Gautam, you also feel the same way? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We definitely right. 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 Now, I, I have another general question, or maybe a little philosophical question. Are we seeing the, the death toll of uh, rhinology now? You know, nobody wants to be doing rhinology, so everybody is running away from the cause. Are we seeing the end of rhinology as a speciality? What, is, what do you think, uh, uh, Naresh Fonda? 
Shakti, uh, uh, like uh, you're absolutely right, you know, because initial uh, whatever mortality uh, mortalities occurred because of COVID happened in, you know, uh, pituitary surgery and then one uh, endoscopic sinus surgery and all those things. So people definitely got scared. And then we know that it's an aerosol generating procedure. The, the risks are great. But at the same time, I mean, uh, now people have started doing um, uh, surgeries. I don't think that it's a, it's a death knell for uh, rhinologic surgery. But yes, one has to be, uh, you know, one has to think twice and get all the tests done, take all the precautions, and then do these surgeries if the need be. So uh, anyone to add to that, Manoj or, uh, you know, uh, both of them? I, I think uh, no. Maybe I am biased, but Mon, uh, but I think um, you know you can actually put off rhinology surgeries much more than you can do for year. Uh, there is a medical part of rhinology that people are actually ignoring, and I think they're rediscovering it now. And I, th I think that's pretty fast. Having said that, Manoj, and I, this is going to be my next question. I know I, we had a patient about a week ago who uh, came with uh, a history of sudden blindness. Uh, for mm -hmm. uh, 30, for, for just for a few hours, you know, she just presented, and uh, the uh, CT scan showed a huge mass lesion involving the sphenoid and the posterior point with compression of the optic nerve. So now, in this situation, what would you do? I would definitely operate. When we are operated on tumors. We operated on um, CSF leaks right. that we have done. So, so there is I an think, aspect. Yeah, yeah. this patient would require surgery more. Yeah, absolutely. So we can't delay in a situation like this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how are we going to do it? Any special? See, we precautions? are getting. We are. Uh, sorry. Uh, shall I? Yeah. See, we, are, we are getting this. Um, you know, uh, mucomycosis. We are getting uh, uh, this uh, massive AFRS causing blindness, bilateral nasal obstruction, tumors uh, in the paranasal sinuses. I mean, these are the cases which we we cannot postpone. We have to operate these patients. So, what are the special precautions there, uh, Naresh? We'll have to, in these situations, we'll have to take, you know, take these patients as COVID positive, take all the precautions. Right. In, so in can... addition to doing a COVID testing for them, RT PCR. Now, yeah. is, is there, a, you know, any one of you surgeons or anesthetists using a PAPR? So I was coming to that. In a situation like that, use a half mask PAPR. And wear a uh, single ply or three mask, uh, layered mask under that so that you don't, your exhalated air doesn't come out. Secondly, do most of the work on the monitor, which in rhinology, as it is, people are doing. Uh, there is nothing to shy away from rhinology service, uh, surgeries, like Mano said. We have also done uh, CSF leaks, AFRS, fungus. And uh, as long as you are safe, patient is safe, uh, I still go by that in our hospital. We have seen the trend. The maximum people who've turned out positive are in administration, finance, from the cafeteria. The clinical situations, the OTs, the clinicians, the number is there, but it is much less because most of us are protected. So the care has to be more during our casual situations. OTs, yes, everything has to be as per the book. And most of the time it is. But if you're sitting in the cafeteria with your mask off, talking to your colleague or chatting, or uh, even uh, you're talking to your secretary with the mask off, those are the situations we are you're likely to get more infected. Now, uh, let me ask uh, all of you, you know, surgeons and anesthetists, what is the medical legal implication of this? Now, let's, let's say a patient comes, uh, you've done a preoperative testing, it's negative, you've taken up the patient for a surgery, let's say, uh, you know, uh, uh, esophagoscopy and removal of, uh, or let or esophagoscopy and, and dilatation of the stomach. The patient is absolutely spaging. And the patient is uh, th three days later, the patient uh, develops fever and uh, then, uh, you know, goes home and, and has fever. And then uh, they do a test and it comes out positive. And the patient is having a, a very, very bad time, uh, you know, is rushed to a hospital and has got COVID pneumonia. Now, where do we stand in this situation? Um, okay, yeah, Mon, I... can I answer this question? Yes. Uh, we are actually, in addition to 
the routine informed consent we are taking a covid consent in pgh chandigarh and this consent mentions that you know you are you have uh, landed in the hospital uh, with this condition and then you are being taken up for surgery these are special circumstances during the covid pandemic pandemic there are chances that though you have tested negative there is a possibility that uh, you may test positive later on there is an increased possibility of surgical complications as evidence in the literature all this is mentioned in an another covid which we call is a covid consent so there are two consent forms one is a routine informed consent which we used usually used to take earlier and this is an augmented covid consent which is taken from each and every patient what is the legal doctor standing of that consent uh we don't know but at the moment i think as far as medico legal um, aspects are considered i think there was some clarification from the government saying that you know if you once you are treating these covid patients i mean they would not stand in the court of law but i am not sure i am not sure no, sir i'll answer that uh, yes sir there is a amendment in the pandemic pandemic act which states that none of the covid patient can take us to the court of law uh, in case they come positive and uh, in fact uh, it is and they cannot blame it to the hospital or they cannot blame it to the to the uh, doctors so it is clear that on the court of law we stand safe especially after that exactly. act, amendment in the act i think the issue is yeah, about yeah, elective surgery the issue is about elective surgery and not the most question is you are taking up a patient for elective surgery uh, where do we stand suppose he develops covid now pandemic act the big question that uh, the pandemic act doesn't uh, cover the elective surgery so the crux is what dr naresh said apart from uh, consent to explain to the patient properly start on a negative note tell him that this can wait but if you want there is a small chance in the pandemic time if he agrees in a written and oral consent then go ahead but pandemic act will not cover your elective surgery Anand, you want to say something? I think it's a very sticky wicket. All of us have consent, especially brought out for COVID, but it all depends on the mood of the judge, because we we've, we've had situations in the past where a patient who signed a consent form was actually explained all the complications of surgery, but still won the case because the judge said you probably didn't explain it to them very well. Depends on the judge. It's a really sticky wicket in India, but we we consenting our patients, they're explaining everything and they're signing a consent. but i don't know if that is going to save the point here uh, uh you know um, that the time between the giving the consent and doing surgery is very important so you can't give a consent and ask them to sign 3 hours before surgery and believe that he would have understood it so i think here is where we need to make a small change not only for this for every surgery that the consent has to be taken at least a few days prior to surgery then you know if you actually have uh, they gone through the main detail and they have uh, signed and agreed it is very difficult for them to argue in any court of law that uh, uh, they did not understand it at all right. and i think that goes for covid too i think like babida said we really are safe it's it's not like we are completely unsafe but then there has to be a clear a agreement with them that the surgery is done on their demand like being an elective surgery and they understand the risk involved i think i don't think there is a big issue out here but i think more i think we are more responsible in the covid to our own staff than to the patient who is uh, who are also equally at risk and that we should not ever forget right now ne next question is again for all of you and i would like uh, opinions from both sides once you start your elective surgeries who is going to be posting the patients the surgeon is going to be posting the patients and create the list for surgery or the anesthetist is going to Let me start with uh, the surgeons first, and then go to the anesthetist. Uh, let me ask uh, uh, Hanna, who is the, what do you, what will be the policy in your hospital? Our hospital policy is the surgical list is made by the surgeons, but for that PAC is done by the anesthetist, anesthesia team, and only once he is found fit, uh, uh, he is posted for surgery. The list is sent by the surgical team, and then it is a mutual consensus. Suppose there are some issues. About posting a patient, the anesthetist will discuss with us, and we may choose to withhold <laughs> surgery, postpone surgery, uh, depending on a mutual uh, decision making. Uh, supposing there is a, a very important uh, member of parliament who is you know, going to be in the cabinet very soon, 
he wants to have a, a surgery tomorrow. No time for COVID testing. The anesthetist is not at all happy about it. What happens? So if it is an emergent situation, not member of parliament, but medically, if it is an emergent situation, we treat him like a COVID positive. We have a COVID theater. Where every precaution as in the book is followed. Even the surgeons take a bath or uh, after the surgery, the anesthetist takes a bath. So everything is is uh, treated as a COVID positive and the surgery is done. Member of parliament, we will wait. We'll tell him, please wait for 48 hours. There's no problem. It is your safety, country safety. So we will not opt. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to ask you questions. Now, let me ask uh, from the anesthetic side, uh, you know, uh, what, what would be the anesthetic's preference? You know, would you, you keeping all this in mind, Dr. Jagannath, I can see him basically. Yeah, I, I feel uh, that I think the anesthetist should be given the onus of posting the case. Uh, uh, because the list which is in front of him, he can actually see uh, which are some major case and which are minor and how many people are required for each and every case, and the time duration also. You cannot post two, three long cases. So he has, a, he's justified also to post cases according to the number of cases, the type of cases, and the comorbidities the patient has. So all these things play a part when posting, which the surgeon, uh, the due apologies, may be missing it when sending it to the pre-anesthetic consultation. So I feel it is, uh, I think my other anesthetist colleague will agree on this, that the anesthetist has the onus of hosting, uh, seeing the situation of the theatre day and all the other things which I have said. Uh, emergency is no problem, but I think it should be get left to the anesthetist to decide. And also to decide the which, goes, which case goes first and which case can go follow it up. I think all that should be left to the anesthetist to deal with. Thank you. Thank you. So we have here. Another perspective, yes. I, I'll say, I'll say it has to be a collective decision. I believe that both surgeon and anesthesiologist sit together a day prior during the PSC or whatever convenient time during the conferencing. They can have a collective conferencing day fixed and it should be a collective decision taken then and there on that conferencing table. Excellent. So I think that the summary take home point is the surgeon can decide the list, but the anesthetist can be told. Right? Yeah. 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 Fine. That, that, that looks like a good arrangement. <laughs> and we can also cancel the cases. Okay. So I said, be told. <laughs> that you always <laughs> can. <laughs> you are the boss. <laughs> now, I think there's an important comment, which has again come from Seema, who actually has uh, also a, a, you know, a legal... Uh, background, you know, he's got a legal qualification as well, and his his opinion on whether there have been cases in the COVID era or this, he says that uh, he doesn't think so because he says that has actually has there been any cases in the COVID era that have actually gone to court and judgments passed? He says I don't think so because the courts are also closed now, and the presently courts are only taking very important major cases and mostly online. So they really don't have time for such cases like this trivial MLC case and so on. And anyway, the pandemic act has been uh, very nicely explained by Babita also. But the reason I asked you this question is because of the situation from other countries. You know, in Italy, there's been a spate of cases uh, uh, against the medical profession and, and hospitals. For patients who are exactly the same situation. They went for surgeries, came out, they were positive, they sued the hospitals. So there was a spate of cases, but fortunately, in, in Italy also, the cases were turned down by the courts. So, because the European Union was very clear about it. So I think, you know, overall, the, the scenario is in right now in favor of the uh, medical professionals. Now, can I make a point? Yeah? Yes, yes. Uh, the, when it comes to legal issues, from what I can understand is, if a patient feels that some injustice has been done, he got the infection in the hospital, then in retrospect, the question would come that whether the surgery was done with you using proper protection, whether in the post-operative period there was another patient who was, who was COVID positive, who was also there in the ward and things like that. So we have to keep a list of the things that we do and also from where we got the PPE kits and etc. And so that we can actually justify that we have taken all the precautions etc. So I, I would think, add on. I think so. Yes. <laughs> I, would, I would just add on that in this era of uh, COVID, definitely the court is 
uh, understanding and is really with us with healthcare worker and they do see logics and i i mean uh, we don't have, frankly speaking we don't have to unnecessarily too much bothered about the medico legal aspect because i i believe that they do understand the ch- they do understand the chances of false uh, negative if a patient who is next to uh, another patient's bed becomes positive later on uh, in the post op area there still so this is there has always been that we don't have to be really much worried about the medico legal aspect i believe that i understand that we are pretty safe on that aspect i think we don't have to be very defensive we don't have to be very defensive is right Yeah. uh covid era I, i don't think people will question you people sitting at home are getting uh, corona so it is not even if they come to a hospital set up for some reason even if it's a false negative it is 30% if it is hospital environment it is so we are pretty safe on that as well yeah. but dinesh uh, say- yeah mohan uh, yes, can i ask you? yeah uh, i have one anesthesia question and that is we have distinguished anesthesia uh, in the panel and that is that um, uh, you know how do they obviate cough at the time of extubation you know the patients tend to have uh, at the time when they have extubated there is lot of cough these patients have and do they employ any specific means to reduce cough at the time when the patient is being extubated okay yeah. who's going to answer this prakshardha you want to say for, something for me morphine is king i there are many ways uh, one is uh, that we can we are all what we are following also lignocaine spray spray a bit of yeah lignocaine spray a bit of uh, but then that has to again through the plastic uh, cover another thing is that a bit of a uh, uh, small little doses of uh, dexmedetomidine that is 0.5 microgram or 0.25 to 0.5 microgram at the time of extubation and uh, and extubating in the deeper planar of planar deeper plane of anesthesia yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah i can cover with ambita yeah it's absolutely right but uh, the important key word that you said was that you know that you're going to be spraying <laughs> with the cane protective yeah. cover because again don't forget the spray itself is aerosol generated yes so yes that, that's something to or a uh, iv lidocaine iv zarocard what is the what is the role of iv lidocaine Yeah. Yes, I just mentioned that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just I, mentioned. Yeah. I just okay. mentioned this. That is IV uh, preservative-free IV lignocaine. In fact, a uh, uh, IV propofol. Again, sub anesthetic doses of IV propofol can also be used. Okay. What about although, the although we, report, we, you know, we, after the patient is extubated, recovered, sent off from the ward to the room or postoperative uh, unit wherever? What about coughing there? the patient is fully recovered yeah that's so, important no so you have to be careful during that time also but if if there is a risk factor for coughing in the post op then uh, at that uh, point iv lidocaine but i mean you cannot you cannot uh, yes, you cannot uh, judge that when is going patient going to uh, cough anand you yeah, can take i did uh, uh, yeah mohan jagannath okay. yes yeah, yeah. i think uh, i will never let give some nebu in case see now don't forget that this cough is generally not only due to your endotracheal tube it can be to the surgery done in the oropharynx but Something nebulization again but nebulization yeah. yeah see nebulization we, we, uh, sir i i will uh, not prefer to have nebulization because of aerosol generation i would like to have anything iv at that time and i believe that uh, anand probably has something to add this is where we can debate yok so basically uh, what I... what i was trying to argue was exactly what professor mohan was saying that your cough is doesn't sh- shouldn't actually be cough suppression shouldn't be sub- limited to the ot table because he is going to go out to the room and he is going to go back to the ward so what i personally do is fine if i am actually a Firstly, because it's an ENT surgery, I'm hesitant in a deep extubation. I want the airway reflex yes. to be absolutely normal as possible. For most surgery under ENT, particularly tonsils and major surgeries, I would add morphine and actually give them another dose before they wake up. Reason: morphine is an excellent antitussive. Think about codeine syrups, and it lasts for around five hours. You know, so by the time they're back in the ward, they've woken up, they're with their attendants, they're happy, they've seen the surgeons, and everything is stable. 
it takes care of the cough for around four to five hours after the after the left duty. So I get a really cough cough free. Their airway reflexes are fine, but they're not coughing on your face when they're excavating, and it lasts for around three to four hours afterwards. Dinesh wanted to say something. Yes. Yeah. Uh, one dose of midazolam also can be helpful. Midazolam. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. It's it's going to be transient, if I might add. It's only going to last for yes. half. Yes. So you want to have a sir, person and and often that. Morphine is, yeah. I, I agree with you. Morphine is an excellent additive, sir. In fact, uh, we uh, ENT surgeons also like morphine quite a lot, you know, because uh, it, it really suppresses the cough uh, reflex quite a bit. So it's uh, it's a good drug to consider. I think many of the old drugs may again make the reappearance, you know. Like, like scoline has scoline uh, yeah, is a big way. Exactly, scoline is now again coming back. So I think a lot of these things uh, are now finding a place. Uh, so I think. Uh, you know, this is a important uh, point to keep in mind that the post-operative period also is very important. So, I, actually, we are coming now to the end of uh, you know the, uh, the webinar. Time is now uh, already up. Uh, but before we go, uh, a couple of things I actually wanted to you know uh, is more on a philosophical note. Uh, you know about uh, when I was sitting and thinking about when, how long are we going to be delaying this? You know. How long is this going to go on? I just happened to be reading a, a book, almost uh, providentially, it was an answer to my question about where, how long are we going to be postponing to the book by uh, the famous author called Vivian Green. And uh, what she said was, uh, life isn't about waiting for the storm to pass. Instead, it's about learning how to dance in the rain. And I, this word's not my head. You know? So yeah, I think yeah, that's exactly <laughs> what we're doing now. You know, we have to learn to dance in the rain. And that means we have to learn to work under adverse situations, not uh, just wait for uh, you know, all this to go. But having said that, also uh, the last uh, comment is from, you know, the very famous statement from the Persian, uh, you know, work, uh, a very famous Persian statement by uh, the poet Rumi. He said, this too shall pass. So I think this too will pass. So we'll have to be optimistic about that. It may be a year, it may be two years, but a day will come when this virus is beaten by human mankind, you know, and we will all uh, come out uh, victorious. We've seen several adversities, but uh, it's not that it's not going to cow down the, the human spirit. We will survive, we will pass, and I think uh, all of us will see the end of this uh, sooner or later. Hopefully sooner, you know, but uh, it will happen. So on that note, I would like to thank the panelists. Sir, for yes, sir. sir I, and can I take just two minutes to show yes, one of my few slides? I'll just share. Actually, yeah. I could not share it before that because I made it during this webinar. There are only five slides. Please just go ahead. Please people. go ahead, please. And before I show this uh, uh, slides, I'll just say that, yes, as you said, the challenges do bring opportunities. So we have to get opportunities out from these challenges and we will pass this. Your voice is breaking, Babita. Your voice is breaking. Madam, you are muted. Unmute myself. So can uh, can uh, who is going to share my screen? Uh, uh, Arun, I just do share the screen. Yeah, You'll have to ask permission. You just yeah. ask permission to share screen. There's a green button at the bottom green of button, your screen. Green button, screen share. Uh, no, is there? Uh, yeah, yeah. I you ask for screen that. share. Yes. So your screen is sh you are screen sharing. Can you see? Yes. yes. Can you? So all of you can see. So I'll just uh, talk about a bit about uh, uh, powered uh, air purifier respirator, PAPR, an innovation from PGIMER. It is basically a scuba diving mask. It seals very well because of silicon lining. It, have mod it has been modified. We have modified it to uh, take two HME viral as well as bacterial filter, and it provides nearly 99.99% filtration. Its cost, total costs is nearly 2250, but it is, if you reuse it, cost comes very economical. So this is what it is being used for. So you have a scuba uh, diving mask. Then uh, there are two uh, viral filters, HME filters, and there is 
so if if you are able to see the scuba diving mask does have a valve and this particular portion this particular portion fits so well over the nose and ma and the mouth that there is no fogging on the vision of this is mainly actually being so useful for ENT surgeons or any surgeon that you can perform your surgeries very well. So this is, there are two HEPA uh, filters, sorry, two HME filters being attached and there is a connecting tube and this is how it works and it is being actually being the innovation of Dr. Ramandeep. I would like to uh, acknowledge him. So he's been using it for nearly uh, a month time so the cost of the mask is 1800 500 for ceiling and pipes 250 for both the filters total cost comes to around 2250 sterilization is by cleaning with uh, cleaning it with hypochlorite or uh, alcohol based and letting it uh, then finally getting it plasma done and uh, this is basically thanks to dr ramandil work another thing which i would like to just share dr handa mentioned that the most of the healthcare workers are prone to COVID uh, uh, infection in a non-COVID or a COVID undetected area. So I we generally take a pride that by now, till now, 650 healthcare workers have been posted in, national, in the Nehru Hospital Extension, which is turned to a COVID hospital. And it done, all of them have been tested and none of them have come positive. But positive patients, positive healthcare workers are there from uh, PGI MER. However, they have been positive from so-called non-COVID area, which is actually which are, which are actually COVID undetected areas. So this is uh, currently we have around uh, fifteen, uh, sorry, twenty-one patients in NHC. Uh, initially, we started taking all patients of uh, COVID, be it COVID positive, be it asymptomatic, or be it uh, uh, not uh, asymptomatic. And uh, now we have been instructed by the uh, UT administration that in PGI, we can take only moderately or moderate or severely sick patients. So out of these 21, all are nearly high viral load, but all are being managed, when only managed well. Only one is in the ventilator. Thank you. Can I, can I, am I audible? Yes, yes. You can yes. Hear. So this is what I just needed to share our own experience. Is it available commercially, PAPA? Uh, no, it is still not available commercially. Raman has uh, got it made from his friend who has been interested in doing this. Uh, so it is currently not commercially available, but the person can make it if if it is made in the number of like 50, I believe Raman had been mentioning that the cost can come down to nearly 2,000. So and this can be... Scuba mask can be got commercially anyway. No, basically, this is a full-face scuba mask with a snorkel attached. You know, the one that the is full-face. So a normal you, scuba mask will only cover the eyes and the nose, but you have to uh, wear a snorkel separately. So this is the full-face variety with the snorkel attached. Yeah. They put yes, yes. If you can see, this is what Ramandeep uh, developed, right? This is Ramandeep developed. Yes, Ramandeep. yes, 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 sir. So if the Ramandeep got it made from... Picture, what this is? is commercially available. This is a half uh, uh, mask, yeah. uh, it's a respirator yeah. with two filters. And this is also with the filters about 3,000, 3,200 rupees. So, yeah, the... Problem only with this is this is this is not a full mask. So this covers uh, only. Yes. I I think this is only. You have some skin exposed here and there. So you have to wear uh, a, a visor over it or or, or a yes. So that face shield will obstruct your view. So this is especially for the ENT surgeons, especially for the surgeons who have who are dealing with the aerosol generating procedures. I believe this is a beautiful innovation and uh, should, uh, I have told Raman to go into the commercialization of this. The friend of his can go, but I believe that uh, he didn't even share it with the PGI group also. So he didn't want him to be, you know, in the limelight, but then this is a very, very good uh, innovation. Yeah, I, I have seen him working under this. Very... It's beautiful. He, his only, uh, the whole of the fogging is only in this area. And the rest of the area is very clean. Yeah, thank you, Babita. I think it's a very, very nice. This is very useful for 
rhinology procedures and so on. But I can yes. see for autology procedures with the microscope, this might be a problem. So there, I think the one that uh, you know Humut showed is from 3M, where you have what you call the Kylo Ren mask. You know, this, uh, you've got these two uh, things filters aside. You can actually use a microscope with that. So I think both have a place, you know, in in the, in, in autolaryngology. But important thing is you have to protect yourself. Uh, then yes. uh, so. So I think on that note, I think uh, you know, I think our time is up. We've actually exceeded time. So uh, a final vote of thanks from uh, from Jansen. Uh, I would uh, request uh, you know uh, Prabhu uh, to, to finally give the thank vote of thanks. But a big thank you to you, Prabhu, from Jansen, from all of us. And thank you, sir. A pleasure. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. So on behalf of Anson, you know, I thank the Academy for giving this opportunity for the collaboration, especially the Chairman, President and the Secretary, the project is who is, you know, always uh, coordinating with us to happen, you know, this uh, pro program in real. And I thank all the panelists and speakers and ENT surgeons and anesthetists for the wonderful, you know, program today. And a lot of take-home messages have been given, you know, for the participant across India. And thank you uh, once again for, you know, uh, the Academy. Over to you, Adam. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank thank you. you very much. It was wonderful thank interacting so with everyone. It was a great talk, Mohan. Well, it was really good. Have you enjoyed it? Thank you very much. Not thank a good you very good. much. I'm going to grill Ramandeep about the mask. He has not told me. <laughs>